Hello and welcome to our midweek service as we return to the book of Ruth, following on from the studies in the first five verses last week, which was the beginning. If you haven't watched that, you might like to go back and just get the context, but I'll recap a little today. So just for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the book of Ruth and uh, journeying with its theme of of recovery from crisis and disaster. I was suggesting last week that one of the things we all need to allow ourselves to do uh, in this recovery period, we're not, uh, I hesitate to call it a post-pandemic because we're not quite post the pandemic, um, certainly not in a global sense, but we are at a place where we're emerging from restrictions and recovering something of what life was like before. But it's also worth taking time just to pause and to feel the sense of loss uh, the shock, whatever it has felt like for you. And the story of Ruth is one that starts off with crisis, as we saw last week, and then moves on into resolution and hope and new beginnings. And so that's one of the reasons why I believe it's what I'm supposed to be looking at just now. So let me pray, and then we'll pick up from verse 6 in chapter 1 today. Let's pray together. Gracious God, a loving Father, thank you for your word and thank you for an opportunity to take time out and to listen and reflect and think about it together. Father, we thank you for the way in which your ancient word, which comes from uh, time and place so far from our own, yet still has living dynamic power to speak to us and to give us hope and encouragement and to challenge us. Lord, as we come before you, we pray that nothing might stop us or hinder us from hearing what you would say to us today. And Lord, we thank you that we come in the name of Jesus and that it is in his name alone that we may come into your presence and may have confidence in the knowledge that Jesus' death on the cross is the means whereby we may come and call you Father, ask for your cleansing and forgiveness, and know that you grant it where we turn to you with repentant hearts. So Lord, would you move in our hearts and in our lives? Would you cleanse and forgive us from all that might stand against us? And would you help us as we come into your presence, Lord, to be open to your Spirit's teaching and leading through your word. Be with us, Lord, today, where we are and as things are with us. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's turn then to Ruth chapter 1 and verse 6. The context for these verses uh, for this next passage is that Ruth uh, left with her husband Elimelech and two sons Machlon and Kilion, left Bethlehem and Judah in the southern kingdom. In the period of the judges, so before the, there was King Saul or David, this was after they'd entered the promised land, but before there had, the, the kingship had begun. And it's the period known as the period of the judges. And despite uh, entering a land of promise, of a land flowing with milk and honey, uh, famine had come. Uh, there's good reason to suggest that the way Israel was failing to live according to God's word was the reason why they weren't enjoying the blessings in the land they were supposed to. Deuteronomy chapter 28 spells out blessings and curses that will flow either from obedience or disobedience. And so famine has come and the land of promise has turned out not to be as promising as they had hoped, perhaps. And so Ruth with Elimelech and their two sons leave for Moab on the other side of the Jordan what we would know as modern day Jordan. Um, and so they settle there and uh, Elimelech sadly dies. And then Machlon and Kilion marry local women. But after 10 years and 10 years in a culture where there was no birth control. And so uh, it was expected that children would start coming along more or less straight away. But after 10 years, there's no word of children. And then both boys die. And so Ruth, uh, Naomi rather, finds herself in a foreign land with these two daughters-in-law. Uh, she's lost all the men in her life in a culture that depended on men for provision and protection and food security and so on. And so she concludes, as we'll see today in this reading, that the best option for her now is just to go back to Bethlehem, to return home from Moab and to leave her daughters-in-law behind. Uh, and just to go and see what survival options are hers back in her hometown. So let's read from verse 6. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. 
Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness, as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Amen. May God give us understanding of his word. And so we start then, or last week we started with a wave of crisis and disaster, famine in a promised land, emigration to a land that was not a friend of Israel's or historically had not been friendly towards Israel, and so was foreign territory, the death of her husband Elimelech there, the marriage of her two sons, but 10 years of childlessness and frustrated hope, and then the death of both sons. And so it really is in five short verses, just chapter after chapter of disaster in the life of Naomi. And so the point at which we pick up the story is the, the lowest point, if you like. Naomi is a broken woman. She's defeated. She's resigned. She recognizes that uh, there's nothing left for her except perhaps to crave uh, the, the, the kind of um, hospitality or welcome or support of relatives, as we'll discover. She still has uh, a piece of land there, um, but no one to farm it and, and in a culture, as I said before, that was dependent on men running things. Her options were very limited. And so it's in that heavy hearted spirit that she resolves to pack up and go home. I'm intrigued by the fact that the three women seem to pack up the household with the intention of all going back to Bethlehem. Perhaps the daughters-in-law uh, had no option but to go with their mother-in-law in that culture. They were part now of their, of their mother-in-law's household, and, and therefore they didn't have the kind of freedom or the options just to decide what they would do. And so it seems that Naomi in her head and heart was intending for all three of them to go back together um, until it came to the point where having packed up and set out on the journey back towards Israel or towards Judah rather, towards Bethlehem, uh, Naomi suddenly realized what she was doing in taking these two women away. Perhaps Naomi just wanted to cling on to uh, the, the security, the solidarity of these women that had been part of her household for the last 10 years. But nonetheless, the relationship amongst them was such that uh, Naomi presumably thought that they would just stay as a unit together. We're not given uh, insight into the processes in their heads and hearts. Did Orpah secretly uh, hold a notion that she would love to be able to go back to her own family and not have to leave her country and settle amongst the foreign people where she would be an outsider? We don't know. 
Uh, was Naomi planning all along to go back on her own and, and she didn't really realize such was her distraction or depression or grief that Orpah and Ruth were preparing to come with her? It seems unlikely. Or was it simply that when they got out to the road and began the journey back, Naomi realized that she was ripping these women out of their home and community, that actually the, the safer and more sensible, reliable options for them would be just to go back home and see if they could uh, meet and marry other men and have children and a future. It seems certainly the more likely case. And so Naomi, when they get to the road and they're facing the journey, decides that despite the comfort that her two daughters-in-law might otherwise have provided for her, the generous thing, the sensible thing, the wise and right thing to do is to let these women go back and be back with their families and have another chance of married life and children. And so that seems to be the reason why Naomi on the road, uh, because as they packed this up, why didn't they have this conversation in the house that Naomi has had a change of heart? and sends the girls, or attempts to send the girls back home. Orpa, after, well, at both girls initially, refuse the idea and resist, saying that they will definitely go with their mother-in-law. But Orpa is open to being persuaded, and she decides to go back home. She's loyal to Naomi, but her loyalty is tempered by a reality that she can see a future for herself. And so as she goes back into uh, her home community and her home family, there's a parting and a tear-stained parting at that. And then, of course, we come to Ruth, after whom the book is named. And Ruth uh, tenaciously clings to her mother-in-law with that beautiful uh, speech that in, on many occasions, although it's not a wedding speech, uh, I've heard these words read at many a wedding, read them myself. Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. What a beautiful declaration of loyalty. And we don't know what it was in Ruth's heart or character other than she was completely willing to put her own needs at Naomi's disposal, uh, to put her own needs uh, behind her for the sake of making Naomi a priority and was willing to commit to her mother-in-law. They had had house and home and family together for 10 years. I don't think there's any censure for Orpa that she made the decision to go back, but certainly she didn't have the same sense of loyalty and commitment that was going to take her to a foreign land. But Ruth did, and Ruth had simply decided that she saw or understood just the depth of grief and loss that Naomi had undergone, and that she was going to make sure that Naomi was taken care of or looked after that she would have company, solidarity, support. And so Ruth makes this choice to put her own needs second to the needs of her mother-in-law. It's a beautiful picture of self-sacrifice. It's a beautiful picture of a woman who was willing to lay down her life for the sake of the needs of another. And I suppose it's a very gospel picture. It's a picture of Jesus who comes and lays down his life for the sake of all of us sinners who need rescue and salvation. It's a picture of the servant king, of, of the one who uh, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very form, uh, a human form, a, a human nature, uh, and taking the form of a servant, as we read in the Philippian hymn in chapter 2. And so we have this lovely picture of loyalty and devotion. What was in Ruth's heart is simply that, loyalty and devotion. There is no sense that she has any inkling or sense of vocation, any sense that what lies ahead for her in Bethlehem is going to be full of hope or promise. She knows that she's now going as a sole foreigner uh, with her mother-in-law 
back to the land or into the land of Judah, back home with Naomi. And so in all of the disaster, in all of the crisis and the loss that is in this first chapter, there is just one tiny glimmer of hope. And it is the loyalty and commitment of another person. You know, we've come through an awful lot in the last 18 months and uh, perhaps one of the things that has sustained you, certainly has sustained me, is just connections and relationships with other people. The sense that we go through this experience together in solidarity with one another. The sense that we're not alone, even though it's been difficult. And sometimes we may not feel that we've got very much to offer. It may not feel that we can solve somebody's problems or we can carry their burdens very well. We can't take away the difficult thing that has happened to them. We can't undo the past or, or whatever crisis has befallen them. But like Ruth, like Jesus, what we can do is to remain loyal, to cling to, to be there for our friends, even silent presence, the companionship of another person there can be all that is needed to help somebody carry their own cross or bear their own burden. Ruth and Naomi had a long walk back from uh, Moab to Bethlehem, and perhaps much of that was just conducted in silence. The solidarity of these two women, Naomi nursing her heavy heart with a certain amount of bitterness and uh, disappointment and hurt towards God, this non-comprehension perhaps, but certainly when she gets back and everybody is marveling at Naomi, perhaps the appearance of her, perhaps she's aged so much. And certainly she went away full and she's come back empty. She went away with a husband and sons and she's come back uh, a widow without her children. And so no doubt grief is etched all over her face. Her external circumstance or her circumstances would be worn externally on her face and so Naomi arrives in Bethlehem and all the others marvel at this uh, elderly husk of a woman who has lost all the fullness and all the hope that she went out with when she left for Moab and Naomi speaks to them with a, a tone of, of obvious bitterness the name Naomi means pleasant the name Mara that she chooses for herself means bitter. She's gone out pleasant. She's come back bitter. The Lord's hand has gone out against her. 